Now, who's standing? Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Trump is error. Maybe things true. Don't be trapped by dogs. This is continuity. This is because I'm That's how weird it is done. Revolution gets its name by always coming back around. And you're getting a hustle in himself. What about a fuck you? We're just being very honest and truthful, telling y'all the truth. Kæru hlustendur, velkomin í Píratasbjallið. Píratasbjallið verður í dag í fyrsta skiptið á ensku. Dear listeners, welcome to Pirate Chat, the Icelandic podcast on Icelandic politics. However, today our show will be in English as the topic of discussion is the uh, very just around the corner European elections. With us today we have Matthias Bjarneman, the front runner of the Pirate Party of Sweden, and Karen Riley, a security and policy advisor uh, who will uh, help us kind of look into what the beast of uh, the European elections, the European Parliament is. They're right around the corner. Around 400 million people are eligible to vote. Voting will take uh, a couple of days. 751 seats are up for grabs. There is one continent. What effect does this election and the parliamentary and the parliament have on its members? What effect does it have on the world? What can we expect from these elections? So first of all, welcome, Karen who's joining us in the studio. Great to be here. And Matthias, called Mab. Welcome from somewhere campaigning in Sweden. Thank you. I'm currently in Stockholm. It's a little town up north. (laughs) So for both of you, but perhaps uh, more for you, Mab, uh, having worked in the European Parliament since 2011, what is the European Parliament, what is it in comparison to the Council of Europe? What is it compared to the European Union? Oh, so the Council of Europe is a totally separate entity outside of the European Union. So I will put that to the side because I I actually don't know great much about it, except that they do some nice papers every now and then. So the European Union has uh, two co legislators it's the Parliament and it's the Council, um, which is not the Council of Europe, it's a different council. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and the third um, institution that you should be aware of is the Commission. So the Commission is sort of an equivalent of a government, and they are the ones proposing legis- legislation. And then the Parliament and the Council are the co-legislators, like in a two-chamber uh, system, uh, that have to legislate together. So they work on the text uh, by themselves, and then they try to merge them into one common proposal. So the parliament is is the, the part of the le- well, that is the part that is directly elected by the the citizens, and then the council is uh, it consists of the governments of the member states. Right. How many people work in the parliament, the European Parliament? Well, right now we're all, most of us are on, on leave for the elections, but on a, on a normal day, I would say around 7,000. That's the, the number I've heard. If you include everyone from people working in the cafeteria to the political advisors to the staff working with the members of parliament and, of course, the parliamentarians themselves. Uh, roughly 7,000 people. That is, being Icelandic, I appreciate that number. That could be not half my nation, but a good chunk of the Icelandic nation working in mm-hmm. one place. It sounds big. It sounds perhaps bureaucratic. What actually comes out of this apparatus? What comes out of the European Parliament? Well, the idea is that uh, the Parliament is supposed to, you know, come up with a position of the, representing the people of Europe. So it, it might seem bureaucratic, but if you take democracy and you make it bigger, you will also get more people working in that apparatus. Speaking of, you said there are, uh, there's the commission, and then you have the council, which is not the Council of Europe, and then you have Mm -hmm. the parliament, where people, the people, the the people that are uh, eligible to vote in Europe, um, get to vote people in, right? The 751 you mentioned. Uh, What comes through that? What type of legislation, how does this affect the, well, 
the, the half a billion people, how does this affect the continent of Europe and everyone there, whether they're eligible to vote or not? Uh, so uh, the member states have delegated some powers to the European Union to decide on. Mm -hmm. And everything that is delegated is then handled through the, well, most of it is handled through the common legislative process where the parliament and the council work in tandem. So it could be anything from uh, regulating, you know, shipping trade, uh, cross-border transports, uh, roaming fees, basically anything that would affect your everyday life is likely to be affected one way or another from European legislation. And of course, if you if you live in the um, European economic area uh, outside the EU, then you would still be affected by a lot of this uh, legislation because of the agreement you have with the EU. So the European economic area, which countries uh, are in that? I mean, Iceland. Excellent. It's Iceland and Norway and I think Liechtenstein and some others. I don't know exactly every single one of them. Right. But the EFTA country is, is the main chunk. Right, right. So a lot of legislation is going through here. Uh, legislation that um, has an effect on everyday lives of people that are living within this collaborative space that is the European Union. Um, Karen, as... As, from a security, from, from, from a policy perspective, how does this affect, what type of policy will have a direct effect on how people live? Well, there's a lot of things that where the EU has meant accelerated progress for things like workers' rights. Um, if you're a UK citizen, the EU working time directive means that you have vacation days. Mm -hmm. It means that the work week is capped at a certain number of hours. So there are some things that, that people take for granted because they've been around for a long enough time. Mm -hmm. There's also, in the EU, we, we enjoy better quality of life because we have environmental regulations, agricultural regulations, we have regulations on uh, medical uh, medical research, um, the, the regulations on medications that are things that you may not want to read a 30-page EU <laughs> report on it. Um, it's not exciting stuff unless it goes wrong. Mm. And we have the enormous privilege of living in a place where everyday life moves fairly smoothly. And a big part of that is the work that's being done in Brussels and Strasbourg. Yes, it's not only policy, but there's a lot of research that goes into things. Mm -hmm. um, there are the, the big things like uh, controlling uh, diseases among livestock, where you know, foot and mouth disease was in the news several years ago, and it had a catastrophic effect on agriculture. But there are EU-funded projects to make sure things like that don't happen again. If you're in Scotland, uh, there's actually a project called SheepNet, which is focused on connecting sheep farmers all across Europe to share information on how to increase lamb survival rates. So if you eat lamb or wear wool, the EU is ensuring the survival of livestock so that you can still do that. Just for clarification, SheepNet does not use Bitcoin, does it? No, it's it's knowledge. It's it's a useful project. For for a short while, I was hoping that you would tell me that all those sheep would get connected to the internet, and we would have an internet of sheep. <laughs> uh, I was just hoping for that when I heard sheep net. But well, this also sounds good. But an internet of sheep would be better. You could you know put them little tag on every one of them, connect them. I mean, you could make a mesh network of sheep, but uh, the, there there are latency issues involved in that. <laughs> and I tend to agree with Mob on this one. Uh, the Internet of Sheep is something I would love for the European Parliament to take on um, after elections. Uh, I'll see what I can do on that. <laughs> Thank you, Mob. Being the front runner for the Pirate Party in Sweden, do you find that people have knowledge, have an understanding of what it is that you have 20 members right now, members of the European Parliament from Sweden, right? From from different parties. Do the, does yeah, the, have, the public know what they're doing or what kind of benefits they're reaping from this collaboration? 
Well, I, I think they, they might not know what they're doing, and they probably don't know even know their names. But uh, in general, I think people have a sort of a general understanding of what the EU does, not necessarily in detail. But then again, you don't know the everyday life of your national government either. So that's not very surprising. I mean, generally, if things work, you don't think about them. So you will normally only think about the EU whenever you find something that annoys you. Same as with your national government. I mean, when you're all happy with them, you don't really care. Uh, <laughs> But no, but I mean that that's how we in the best of worlds we wouldn't have to worry about our government at all. They would just, you know, manage things. But that of course is not the truth. And it's not the truth in the EU level either. Depending on who we elect to go there, they will come up with better or worse legislation. Mm. Absolutely. One of the things that you hear uh and have heard across Europe is we're we're electing some people and then some other people are being sent down. They congregate in Brussels and they congregate in uh, once a month, if I, if I remember correctly, in Strasbourg. And then they legislate on sizes of bananas or uh, how, how the shapes of cucumbers. Um, is that correct, Mob? Can you confirm that this is in fact the work? No, that's not really correct. So they, they've made, and that's not even the parliament, it's the implementation by the commission, mm. classifications of different categories for transporting vegetables so that you can uh, pack them e more easily. But it's not, you don't say what is a banana. You basically say what is a standardized banana that can go in a standardized pack and what has to go elsewhere. Uh, but I mean, that those are just the myths that you will hear when people want to criticize the union. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, the legislation, I mean, we do de sometimes do detailed legislations, but generally it, it, it is on a more abstract level than the shape of bananas. But which, which chemicals are allowed into food would be something that the EU would legislate on. Absolutely. Food security. Yeah, things like the, the regulation of pesticides is, is enormously important because most of agriculture, even if you're a vegan, you're still relying on bees and other pollinators. And so having a forum where legislation is created to ensure food security mm -hmm. and, and also the research going into um, the balance between controlling pests and making sure that pollinators die out, that's a, a very valuable thing that the EU does. And there's a lot of far-right campaigning um, right now that's saying, oh, look at this, this poor piggy bank that's empty because all the money went to the EU. And, and what a lot of people don't realize is that that money is coming back to mm. every EU member state, even if it's not in the form of structural funds for economic development, it's still the EU is paying for a body of knowledge that benefits anybody who breathes air, drinks water and eats food. That's a good chunk of us, I would say. So the directives, the regulations that come out of this massively big, you know, beast of bureaucracy, uh, how do they affect, I was thinking in particular, there was a very complex or very vast uh, regulation that passed some years ago and got two years to be implemented, the General Data Protection Regulation, um, which is something that I think most countries either struggled with or were kind of pretty prepared for with both national legislation and not. But it was one of the more complex pieces of legislation that came out of the EU that affected all of us, right? Um, what, speaking not from a devil's advocate point of view, but it seems like a lot of work. It seems like a new structure. It seems like for countries that are in the European economic area, like Iceland, why it, it's, it's, being, it's coming through, it has to be adopted nationally, it's every company, it's every you know association, NGO that has to abide by these rules. Is it really necessary, Karen? Well, I mean, speaking from the perspective of somebody who spent many years talking to companies and, and begging them to think of, of people with horrendous threat models um, from their use of everyday technologies. If you're a marginalized person, if you're part of that list 
of special categories uh, in the GDPR mm -hmm. of somebody because of their membership in a trade union, their sexuality, their national origin, their um, you know, ethnicity. There are many people that are harmed as a result of commercial platforming platforms being cavalier mm -hmm. about their data. And so the companies that have been thinking of their end users as human beings with rights to privacy and self-determination, they're fine. The companies that don't really care so much about people, but are very interested in making sure that the data centers run uh, in a way that's easier to manage, mm -hmm. they're fine. It's the companies that have ignored these, these things that are in bad shape. You know, from a business perspective, so the GDPR requires that you know where the data are, uh, who you're sharing them with, why you gathered them in the first place. From a business perspective, why would you be mm -hmm. gathering data mm -hmm. if you don't know what it's for? Mm -hmm. uh, and from the human rights perspective, why would you want a company having vast amounts of data on you and then not knowing when there when there's data breaches happening? These things should not have been happening in the first place. Mm. So these things don't come out of the ether. They're uh, part of best business practices. If you're in Germany and you've done the certification for the Federal Agency for Information Security, then GDPR is not going to be much of a challenge for mm. you. Mab, you worked you worked on this, didn't you? You you were working on the General Data Protection Regulation. Did it just magically appear out of the blue? Like, where did the no, massive you, thing come from? I, I like how you constantly repeat "massive." It's a regulation. They they tend to be quite uh, complex. It's nothing unique with this. Uh, so, I, I did work on the GDPR before it was cool, uh, uh, but I mean, it didn't come out of nowhere. The regulation is a result uh, of the fact that the old directive that is replaced, which was the Data Protection Directive. Uh, was uh, poorly implemented in a lot of member states and it, it didn't have any real teeth towards people who didn't follow it. So, um, for example, a lot of data companies would uh, have their headquarters in Ireland where they had uh, not only a weak implementation of the, of the old directive but also a very underfunded um, agency, supervising agency. So, basically what you've done is you've beefed up the consequences for people misusing personal data. Uh, but the, the principles of the GDPR were already in the old directive and, and a lot of the, the work that a company was supposed to do was already there. It's right. just that now suddenly uh, there's real consequences when you don't follow through, and what, and which should be. Yeah, absolutely. But w w tell us a little, because the, the, the fines can be quite steep. Uh, they can be up to 4% of the global turnover of the company, which means that, of course, a smaller company will be uh, fined to a lesser degree than a bigger one. But it also means that big companies now actually would have to uh, take steps to ensure that they're not fined, because, I mean, that would be a huge loss for them if they ended up being slammed with a fine, mm -hmm. which, which is good, because that means, you know, getting fined, the risk of getting fined is something that a lot of companies uh, prefer to avoid. So if, if that is what it takes to make sure that they care about our privacy, well then, from my point of view, that's just, you know, fine. And increased rights, I guess. Yeah, because they're the, the human rights implications, the, the real harms, and the, the divide between digital life and the real world has always been thin. You know, especially if you're a, a person who has to worry about intimate partner violence, especially if you have to worry about stalkers using technology. And before, NGOs have gone to companies and, say, and said, look, you're, you're enabling stalkerware, you're enabling uh, stalkers to find out where their victims are in real time, mm -hmm. um, and this leads to people being physically harmed. Could you maybe hire people from these groups who can do threat modeling, mm -hmm. who, who care about people who aren't cisgender, heterosexual, white men. Uh, and the, the response has been underwhelming. Now with the GDPR, you can say, fix this, 
or deal with a massive fine. Mm -hmm. And while the GDPR does present challenges to business, the an imperfect implementation of a good idea doesn't render that idea invalid. Mm. So I think it's worth going through this painful process of making companies accountable. So we've talked a little bit about what the parliament <coughs> is, what purpose it's... Can I just add one thing on the GDPR before we move on? Oh, absolutely. So the important thing to know is... Uh, that, that one of the reasons they wanted to replace the directive with a regulation is that that means that now companies have one set of rules for all member states in the EU rather than having to adapt to 27 different set of rules. So even if the rules might be more extensive than before, for any company trying to scale up, which you know a lot of digital companies naturally try to do, it is much more easy because when you comply with the rules in one country, you comply with the rules in all. And that is one of the main advantages of, of having this as a regulation rather than a directive as it was in the past. So, kind of a standardization for ease. Yes. So we talked about what this regulation, sorry, we talked about the, uh, the European Parliament. We talked about the massive, uh, the, the beast of bureaucracy. Um, what we haven't really the regulations and kind of what what is it good for however mob you're campaigning right now and you have been campaigning uh being the front runner of the pirate party in sweden uh, do people know what is happening in the eu you touched upon it before are they excited to vote are they uh, can't they wait to vote now this weekend in the next couple of days well, we have postal voting for three weeks, so uh, I think a good 15% has already voted in Sweden. But no, the voting turnout is lower in the EU elections than in national elections, uh, mainly because the, the media isn't covering the EU nearly to the same extent as they cover uh, national affairs. So I think the awareness about the election is, is lower compared to national elections. And of course, uh, you know, the general interest might not be the same, but, but there has been uh, a lot of coverage the last couple of well the last month or so so i hope we will have a turnout in sweden around 50 percent that is uh, what we had last time 50 percent you say but in normal elections i want to say uh in national elections in sweden you have a pretty high turnout don't you it's it's up in the 80s or 90s even we tend to be just below 90 yeah is, is there anything aside from the media uh, coverage that kind of plays into why it's it's almost half well I think the media coverage is a huge thing because you you, you don't follow EU affairs on a daily basis Swedish media have more correspondence in, in Washington than they have in Brussels mm. so there's clearly a discrepancy on, on news you will see daily ministers and politicians from the parties in Sweden talk about Swedish politics but you won't see them talk about EU policy or politics. So I think that is a, a huge part of it. But it's also, I mean, it goes back to, to schooling. You have uh, my generation, everyone was taught about the Swedish uh, democratic system. We don't know the details, but we feel that we understand it roughly. Uh, and then EU came along much later and our teachers wasn't weren't as confident talking about it. So I think with a generation where the teachers have grown up inside the European Union, the voting will also go up. Um, but I mean, it, it varies from country to country. It's depending on uh, how well you present, uh, well, the need to vote and also how good the parties are at actually talking about what's uh, being legislated in the EU. Uh, a, a big problem in a lot of the campaigns is that they tend to just bring out their own national policies once over again and do the same spiel as they did in the national elections. And then people don't understand what's special with this election and why they should vote here. Right. What is the difference at all? I mean, could there be other things at play? Um, you know the UK context mm -hmm. very well. You live in Germany as well. Mm -hmm. Is there disempowerment? Do people not necessarily see anything except a replication of their national systems? Do they, you know, is the kind of the, 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 the growing fascist kind of veer that we've seen in the last couple of years, has that had an effect or... Or how do you kind of see the 50% is not a lot? No, I mean, uh, how much time do we have to talk about <laughs> uh, the mess that is UK politics? Um, so right now, 
if you are a UK citizen living in an EU member state um, and you've been in an EU member state for more than 15 years, you can't vote. Mm. And even uh, citizens of other EU member states who are living in the UK are being turned away from the polls. And so any time there's a level of disengagement from politics, I always look, where is the disenfranchisement happening? Mm -hmm. And so really, if if political parties have not been making the case about how the EU affects your daily life, and then you think, yeah, I should go vote, because all elections are important, and then you get turned away from the polls, are you going to make phone calls? Are you going to get involved in a court case? A lot of people, especially people who have jobs to go back to, um, they're not going to go through all of those hurdles. Mm. Those hurdles shouldn't exist in the first place. And so the other thing is that a lot of what makes the EU a great place to, to live and work and travel in, those things have been have been running fairly well. And so you don't notice things until they're gone. You know, right now, with like Brexit, all the things that are falling apart, all the people who are realizing that if you're a plant seller in London, uh, you have to rely on trade links between the UK and the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people who their businesses will collapse if Brexit goes through. but those things, until the emergency happens, they're not as noticeable. Right. Whereas far-right populists who uh, are not dealing in facts, they're dealing in feelings. They're peddling racism and, and division. Uh, they, they're good at marketing. They're absolutely terrible things. Mm-hmm. Whereas on the other side, you say, hey, the medications that you take are are safe. Uh, you're not going to buy a, a liter of milk in the supermarket and die from listeria. <laughs> uh, those things, there are a lot of topics that are only exciting if they go wrong. Mm-hmm. The- but I think, I think our national governments have a, a played actually a worse role than that, because mm-hmm. What you see in a lot of member states is that when a good thing comes out of the EU, the governments are very quick to claim credit for themselves, like we did this. But the moment something that they think will be unpopular come out of the EU, they point the finger at Brussels, even though they were there part of the legislation in the council with people from their own parties in the European Parliament probably voting in favor. So I think we've, we've turned the EU into a scapegoat, mm. and that has fed into uh, the right-wing populism that is rising in Europe. Yeah, and there's there's a connection between uh, places in the UK that receive a large amount of structural funds for economic development. A lot of those places voted overwhelmingly for Brexit. Because they weren't perhaps aware that it, you're not just giving money to to the beast. The beast is also giving back. Yes. That the scapegoat is also giving back to you, that you are, of course, that, that it's a, yeah. And if you're in Cornwall, for example, you're getting more than other places in the EU. Oh, why is that? Well, there's a lot of places uh, that are, I mean, agriculture doesn't make a lot of money these mm-hmm. days. It's one of the most perverse things about late stage capitalism is that if you're making an app that uh, is doing targeted advertising and is harming human rights, and, and allowing fascists to interfere in elections, that you're making a lot more money than somebody who's growing food. And one of the things about having a large body and a lot of bureaucrats who are crunching the numbers mm. about those things and distributing funds is that it restores a little bit of that balance. Mm. You know, if you are growing food, the EU has funds that they will give to you so that you can still do that. The subsidizing. Yes, Mm -hmm. which is something that we need because most of us do eat food. It it, it, it turns out, (laughs) yes. Um, So the voting is gonna happen uh, and is happening. um, Mm -hmm. By Sunday, Monday, we should know where we stand. 
pirate parties are running all over Europe. The Czech pirate party is doing very well. They're looking at four to five candidates. Luxembourg, not quite there yet, but have a fighting chance to get a candidate in. Germany is looking good, having a candidate as well. The French pirates are running in a coalition. Mm. You're running in Finland, Sweden. Um, mm. Mab, I wanted to put you on the spot here right before we, uh, we say goodbye. How many pirates will there be in the new European Parliament as per Monday? There will be at least six of them. At least six. Well, you yeah. heard it first here. I will have you back and we will talk about your results. Good luck, happy campaigning, and Karen, thank you so much for joining us. It was great to be here. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Now, who's been on this? On Donald Trump. Trump's era, may we think true. Don't be trapped by dogs. This is continuity. You need to get married. That's how weird it is done. Revolution gets its name by always coming back around, and you're playing. Get a hustle in the middle of the show, but fuck you. We're just being very honest and truthful, telling y'all the truth.